بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم my name is james frankel um, i'm going to be speaking to you a little bit about my experiences coming to islam uh, i'm speaking to you now from honolulu hawaii and it is september 2011 i'm sorry 2010 getting ahead of us um, i am a professor of comparative religion and I teach classes in Islam also at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And um, I've lived in Hawaii now for just over two years, and just entering my third year. And uh, some brothers asked me if I could speak about my experiences. So hopefully, inshallah, um, I can do this today. And if this is helpful to anybody, um, may Allah uh, give us all hidayah. Um, as I said, I came to Hawaii two years ago. Before that, I lived in New York City. Um, I was born and raised in New York City, born in uh, 1969, and um, grew up in, in Manhattan and part of the time in Brooklyn another few years of my life. Um, for the most part, had a very happy family life. Um, my parents... Uh, my parents um, raised me, not with uh, any particular religion, but I think with uh, you know, basic set of moral values. Um, actually, by by heritage, um, my background is Jewish, but I grew up in a very secular household, and uh, there wasn't a lot of religious practice. Um, uh, the only connection I really had to any kind of traditional religion was from my my father's side, my, my grandmother, my father's mother, who was a practicing uh, Jew. And, um, you know, it's from her that I learned a few things, uh, Bible stories, stories of the prophets. Um, and for a brief period, uh, my parents actually attempted to send me to a Hebrew school to learn more, but I was uh, not very comfortable there and actually got kicked out um, for asking too many questions. So uh, this is uh, this is probably my, my character and it has taken me, uh, brought me I should say to where I am today, you know, as a, as a professor and as a Muslim I continue to ask a lot of questions. Um, so I grew up in this way without any real uh, religious um, foundation and this continued through my life into my late teens and uh, you know I, I was actually at the age of 13 I, um, I had two experiences that, that are worth mentioning one I read the communist manifesto of Karl Marx and decided that I was a communist at age 13 um, I, I, I thought the values were, were, were sound and I, I thought the philosophy was, was potentially beneficial to people. Uh, also at that time, I suppose this might be one of the earliest exposures to Islam that I can remember. Uh, my best friend at that time uh, was from Pakistan. I went to an international school, so I had friends from, from all over the world. I had a Pakistani friend who um, gave me a copy of the Quran and thought that it would be, you know, he wanted me to read it. He said, I don't want you to go to hell. And of course, at that time in my life, thoughts of hell or heaven were, were not really in my, in my consciousness. And I think I took the book and put it on my shelf. And there it stayed for many years without being opened. <clears throat> um, a couple of years later, I think I became quite disillusioned as I learned more about the way that communism was actually practiced in many countries in the world. And so I gave up that philosophy as well. And it really wasn't until, when I, until I entered university that I began to ask the questions that would lead me directly onto this path. Um, I think as a child I was always thoughtful and always wondered about the meaning of life and you know those basic questions of why we're here and where we're going why we suffer all of those things were always 
present in my mind, even as a child. Um, but as I got older, and uh, when I went to university, I, um, well, I focused a lot more on my studies until I had a particular experience. You remember the grandmother that I mentioned before? Um, when I was in university, I was living in Washington, D.C., and I got a phone call from my cousin who was going to school in Maryland. And um, uh, they, it was a surprise visit from my grandparents and my aunt and another cousin, and they took me out for dinner. And I spent the evening basically just talking to my grandmother. I told her about my plans to, to start studying Chinese, which I was doing at the time. I told her about my plans to move back to New York, um, uh, to transfer to Columbia University. And it was almost as if I, I saw her and she was giving me her blessing uh, on all of these various uh, decisions that I was making in my life as a young adult. At the end of the evening, I was walking her to her car. And uh, in the parking lot of this restaurant, she, she turned her ankle and she tripped. And I asked her, Grandma, are you OK? And she said, don't worry about me. Just worry about yourself. OK, I thought. And then I continued to walk with her to the car. I opened the door. She got in. I kissed her goodnight. And I said, well, I guess the next time I'll see you will be for Thanksgiving when I come back to New York. And she said to me, God willing. And OK, I didn't think much of it at the time. I closed the door, and off they drove. My cousin took me back to my dormitory. And I went to bed. And early the next morning, I got a phone call. And it was my cousin. And I asked him why he was calling so early. And he said, um, I mean, he had, there was no other way to say it. He said, Grandma died. I said, really? I mean, I thought he was, I thought he was joking, maybe. I said, what are you talking about? And he, he explained that she had a heart attack in her sleep. And of course, her, her final words to me, you know, were, were echoing in my ears. She, I said, I'll see you soon. And she said, God willing. And I said, are you okay? And she said, take care of yourself. So to this day, I mean, it was an unexpected visit and of course an unexpected departure for her. Um, and to this day, I, I can only wonder, you know, about the, the meaning of that, of that encounter with my grandmother, who of course, as I said, was my, my only link to traditional religion. I went back to New York for the funeral and it was a traditional Jewish funeral. And the rabbi who was giving the eulogy spoke about my grandmother and said, Sarah was a rare treasure, he said. She was like a, like a jewel. And now God has taken this treasure back to him. I said, OK. That's what rabbis would say. When the rabbi came to my grandfather's house to pay his respects, I wanted to ask him some questions. I wanted to ask him questions about certain practices that, that uh, are, are practiced in a Jewish home at the time of someone's death. And he told me, don't worry about those things. He said, that's just tradition. I said, OK. Then how about this? In your sermon, you said that my grandmother, I don't know how well you knew her, but you said that she was taken by God. So where is she? And for that matter, where, where will I go? Where will you go? Where do any of us go? And why are we here? And all of those questions that, that well up in the human heart. And the rabbi, I remember very clearly, he looked at his watch and he said, I have to go. And I don't think that he realized how angry that made me. I also don't think that he realized at that time that he set me on a, on a course that would lead me to where I am today. Because I became very interested in those questions. And, and at first, I thought I would try to answer those questions, um, paying respect to my grandmother's memory I would try to find a Jewish community where I could answer those questions. But the communities that I found, and again, I was just 18 or 19 years old at the time, the communities that I found were not satisfactory to me. And I asked the question, which I had asked many times as a child, is God only the God of the Jews? There are only 20 million Jews in the world, and yet there are 
billions and billions of other people. God created them also, right? So I began to study on my own. I began to read the Bible. And that summer, when I was in England, I was there for an internship, um, there were some Christians, some evangelical Christians, who sort of approached me and wanted to socialize. Of course, they also wanted me to accept their, their faith. Um, I thought, okay, why not try Christianity? I've never really thought about it. And in reading the Bible, I came to, to develop a very strong feeling of, of love and respect for Jesus. But that extra leap that they wanted me to make to accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior was not one that I could do. Jesus for me was more like a big brother. Jesus for me was more like a teacher. Um, Jesus for me was a Jew and uh, I couldn't accept the claims that they were making about him but as I said I did develop a very strong feeling of affection towards him I thought okay I'm not going to find any answers to my questions on my own I studied other things I studied Eastern philosophies Buddhism read the Upanishads. I studied Western philosophies, uh, particularly Greek and Roman Stoic philosophy, um, but nothing, nothing really was answering the, the profound questions that I had. And one day, I was back in New York, um, just before I began my, my semester at my new school, and I was at Times Square, and this is back in the early 1990s, so Times Square was very different than it is today. It was much more seedy, you know, kind of raw place. There were drug addicts and prostitutes, and, and there were all sorts of religious preachers. And I remember speaking to one guy, I always love to talk to people about religion, often as a skeptic. And there was one guy who was a Jew for Jesus. And he uh, was telling me what he believed, and I had heard it before. To me, it was basically Christianity. And he asked me if I would pray with him. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't believe what you believe. He said, do you believe in God? And I said, I think I do. And he said, then pray with me. We'll just pray to God. And he put his hand on my shoulder, and closed his eyes, and started speaking to the Father. And I, with his eyes closed, I started to look around at where I was, and I saw at the other corner these men with long black beards, white robes, you know, like jalabia, white turbans. They were African, or African-American, but they looked like they had walked right off the pages of the Bible. They looked like Noah or Abraham or something like that. So I, I thought, hmm, well, I know you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but why not? Why not talk to them? And I went over after the Jew for Jesus finished praying. I went over to them and I asked them what they were, what they were preaching. And they told me I probably wouldn't be interested in it. I said, why not? And they said, well, because you're the devil. I said, really? I'm the devil. And they said, well, all white men are devils. And I said, if I'm the devil, let me just ask you this one question. If I am the devil, why am I so thirsty to know God? And they explained to me that even the devil believes in God. And I asked them, I said, where did you get this knowledge? I actually knew, I mean, I had written a paper in college about... Um, Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam. And so I, I understood that they were probably some derivative of that uh, black nationalist movement. But I asked them what their source was for this, this claim of, of my satanic nature. And they gave me some verses from the Bible, Book of Daniel, I think. And I said, no, 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 no. If I want the Bible, I can go down the street to the Jew for Jesus. 
or to some other Christian, what about your book? Don't you read the Quran? And they said, yes. And so they gave me some, some verse to read from, uh, from Surat al-Kaf. And I took it home. I took home the, the paper that I wrote it on. And immediately I went up to my bookshelf where I had the Quran that was given to me about six years earlier by my friend Mansur. And I started reading. I looked for the, for the passage that they had directed me to. And of course I read it and there was no indication there that I was the devil or that any other white person was the devil. But since I started reading, I went to the beginning of the book and I just began to read. And I read and I read and I read until I fell asleep with the book in my hands. And the next day, I read and I read and I read when I had some free time. And any time I had free time between classes, when I was commuting to school on the, on the New York City subway, um, I was just reading the Quran. And it moved me in a way that other books hadn't. Certainly in a way that the Bible didn't. The Quran's directness and the fact that the Lord of the worlds, right, the Creator, as, it's, as the book describes the author, um, is speaking directly to you at times, in a very direct way, very intimately. It, it moved me in a way that I, 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 had, not in, I had not felt before. And <clears throat> I can't tell you where or when exactly. I know that there were times that I would read it and sometimes I could, fear, I could feel tears in my eyes and running down my face. Sometimes I would read it and the hair on my arm would stand up on the back of my neck. And I can't pinpoint precisely the time or the place, but at some point I think that I had realized that I was reading the words of God. Well, around New Year's of that year, this is, I guess, about 1990, uh, January of 1990, I was out with some friends from high school we were having coffee and they were, they were just talking about what was going on in our lives. They asked me, what do you, you know, what do you believe these days? Because they knew me when I was a communist and they knew me when I was, when I went through many different phases as a young person. And they knew me as someone who didn't really believe in anything. So they asked me and I said, well, I, I believe in God. And they said, really? What God? There's only one God. And they said, where did you get this from? And I said, well, for me, it was from reading the Quran. And they said, so you've been reading the Quran, so you must believe that this is the message of God and Muhammad is the messenger of God. And I said, yeah, I guess so. So they said, okay, let me get this right. You believe that there's only one God and that Muhammad is his messenger. I said, yeah, when you put it that way, I do. And they said, you're a Muslim. And I laughed. I said, I'm a Muslim? You're a Muslim. You're from Pakistan. I'm just a guy who believes in God. They said, no, you're a Muslim. If you believe that there is no God but the one God and that Muhammad is his messenger, you are a Muslim. And I was, I was in shock. I, for the next few days, had to think about what that meant. And... Uh, I contacted my friend Mansur, the one who had given me the Quran when I was 13 years old. He was at University of Pennsylvania, and he was working in the, um, in the Muslim Students Association there, I, I, I think. I thought I had I'd heard that. And so I asked him if he could send me some literature, literature that might you know, in, give a, an introduction to Islam and also you know, the life, of a, the life and, and, and the requirements, I guess, uh, of, of a Muslim. And uh, he sent me a book or, or two, and one book in particular, Islam in Focus. Um, I can't remember the author's name right now, but this book provided a very good introduction, not only to basic beliefs, but also to the five pillars of Islam. And I learned how to make salat. I learned how to pronounce the shahada. I learned how to make my wudu, all of these things from that book. And I started praying. 
I guess you could say I was a, a closet Muslim because I was living in my parents' home at that time and I would close the door and I would say my prayers. And even the first time that I ever fasted in the month of Ramadan, I did it completely on my own. I had no community. I just found out what time the sun would rise and what time the sun would set and ate at the times that, that were permitted. And so for the first six or eight months of my life as a, as a new Muslim, um, I did this completely alone. And my guide was the Qur'an and the book of this scholar. And uh, that's the story of how I embraced Islam, actually. Um, at a certain point, I had to, I had to tell my family. And so this was sort of coming out of the closet. One night at dinner, I was sitting with my family, and I told them, I said, you know, I've been reading the Quran. They said, yeah, we know. We've seen you carrying it everywhere. And I said, I really believe it. And I said, what I've learned is that besides believing, there are certain practical uh, implications of that belief, which I have chosen to follow also. So I guess that makes me a Muslim. My mother's reaction was very strong. She cried. And I think she asked herself and probably looked at my father and, 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 and thought, where did we go wrong? What, how, did we, how, did, how did this happen? I think my father's approach was much more relaxed. He probably thought to himself, well, my son was a communist when he was 13. He was, you know, a skinhead when he was 16. He went through so many different phases, maybe this is just another phase. And I suppose both my mother and my father were onto something. I mean, this was a phase, but it wasn't just a passing phase, or so I thought, or hoped. And my mother must have realized that, that, that I was serious. But of course her reaction was, was, the, was one of fear and, um, and regret, which um, I suppose are understandable when one is uh, ignorant and only has distorted perceptions based on, um, you know, based on, on misinformation or limited information. So there were great challenges in those first years trying to communicate with my parents. I have to say, alhamdulillah, they are very understanding and they've been very um, patient and um, and we've come to a, a very a better understanding. You know, at first I think my mother worried that I would turn into some kind of a monster. But I tried to reassure her that, you know, since embracing Islam, I'm a better student. Um, I think I'm a better son, you know? And, you know, it wasn't as though I was a bad person before Islam. You know, maybe for some people, um, setting foot on this path is, is necessary for them to be able to reform themselves. In my case, I thanked my parents, actually, for giving me the values that I was able to recognize when I came to Islam. And as I said, I wasn't a bad person, inshallah. Islam has made me, makes me, and will make me a better person. So, um, you know, everybody's path is different, how they get there. And even once they embrace Islam, everybody has a different way of understanding this path. Um, for me, it, it, it has a lot to do with learning and knowledge. I think that the basic purpose of life, the basic purpose of Islam, is to gain knowledge. Knowledge of ourselves, knowledge of our, of our world, of our universe, and knowledge of our, of our intimate relationship with Allah. 
So this has propelled me into, into my career. I don't know that I would be a professor today if I hadn't become a Muslim. I'm not saying that everybody should be a professor, but, um, but for me it's been a, a, a long journey of learning and, and now teaching. Um, along the way I've gained a great respect and appreciation for other religions also which I don't think I would have had, had I not had this grounding uh, in Islam. And, um, you know, I think that that's something that uh, new Muslims should take to heart, is that, you know, when one becomes a Muslim, one doesn't become a different person. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that people bring to Islam what they, what they, what they had before. So even among his companions, there were people who had special talents or challenges. And these are ones that they would have to continue to, to work with or to work on um, after, after entering the path. So uh, similarly, I think I, I can say that's true for me. Uh, there are many challenges and you know, life continues to have its struggles. Um, it just requires patience. For me, this is almost a 20-year journey, and only Allah knows how and where it will end. Um, so, my advice to, to new Muslims, or to even to people who have been Muslim for a long time, um, is just to, just to bear with patience and, and, and see what Allah will surprise you with. Um, not with fear, but with, with love and with hope. Um, if there are non-Muslims who are hearing me today, um, I, think, I think you owe it to yourself to, to know as much you, as you can about the things in the world around you. Islam is certainly present in the world. It's almost unavoidable in the news um, and in the world around us. And if you don't know any Muslims, probably will at some point. Um, I think it behooves all of us to, to know each other. So, um, you know, if you're curious, there are lots of resources out there. Um, yeah, if you're in Hawaii, give me a call. Um, I'm at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in the religion department, so um, if I can be of any help, let me know. And, um, and even to those people who are from Muslim families or, or who are, you know, we can always increase in knowledge and, uh, and in compassion and in love for each other. So it's, uh, that's, that's my wish for all of you. And um, thank you for listening. With that, uh, uh, I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.